Okay, so let's talk about that. So we're talking about Bash as a scripting language suddenly. It's not just the shell, now it's a language. Um, Bash is interpreted at runtime. This kind of makes it similar to Python and a lot of other tools. Uh, what that means is we're going to be working through these scripts line by line and the interpreter is going to try and interpret what you want from it. Um, there is no compiler. There's no debugger. Uh, there kind of is actually, but I'm going to show you how that works um, in a later course. A later, sorry, uh, later lecture, not a different in this course, different lecture. Um, but unlike C, we don't build anything, we don't compile anything, all right? Bash scripts are basically just plain text documents uh, that we run. And I'm gonna show you that example in one second. Um, for that reason, it is always best practice to be uh, defining how we want it interpreted. We use this with something called a shebang. And uh, the other best practice is that we use a suffix called .sh or .bash. This is for human readers to understand um, how they're supposed to be running this or what this is. So this is me on Matrix right now, and I'll show you the directory where you can find my examples. It's under uh, uli101 slash scripts, okay? And the first thing I'm gonna do is just show you Hello World because this is how we begin every uh, new language, just learning how to do hello world, basically, right? Uh, so we've seen Echo before, you know how it works. Uh, this time what I'm going to be doing is vim test, and I'll just go ahead and type the same thing again into a document, okay? So this is plain text, this is nothing special, there's no, I didn't create a project in Visual Studio or anything, it's me just typing in Vim. So I'm gonna go and save that, and then let's take a look at it. So right now it's just read writable, for me only, and um, obviously that's not going to make it a script, so what I gotta do is add execute permissions to it, and now this time, when I just call it by itself, notice I'm not using cat, I'm not using anything, this is me just running it. Um, nothing seems to happen, which is weird. So let me take a look at that again. Echo, hello world, yeah, okay. So let me try this again with this, all right. So that's gonna bring me to another topic very, very shortly, uh, but we'll leave that for now. So this time what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start implementing these best practices. Um, you notice when I open this up in Vim, it doesn't really do, it doesn't have a whole lot going on. Um, I'm gonna show you how syntax highlighting starts taking over and that's gonna make our life a little bit easier. So the first thing I'm gonna do is add this um, shebang. So Again, what I like to say about this is um, this is teaching the computer how to run this. Uh, we could have this be a Bash script, a Python script, a Perl script, any number of other kinds of scripts and stuff like that, right? Um, but this is going to force it to be executing it as a Bash script. And what this is right here is the absolute path to Bash, okay? So as soon as we indicate it with this, um, we're gonna be fine. Now, I'm not gonna ask you to memorize this. Um, I believe as you get more practice in this field, it's gonna happen naturally that you just memorize how these things work and what they look like. But it's a hash symbol followed by an exclamation mark. And um, you're going to be asked to put this at the beginning of all of your scripts. It's just good practice, okay? Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rename this test.sh, okay? So now any other people coming around will understand that this is a bash script and not a Python script and not an executable, it's not a C, it's not anything else, it's just bash. Okay, let's take a look at test.sh now. So you'll notice that things have changed a little bit. Um, we have syntax highlighting being applied now. Uh, Vim can recognize this as a bash script and so 
it remembers all of the keywords and things like that and we're in good shape so with that in mind what I can start doing is so showing you some other features of this so first thing I'm gonna do is create a variable hopefully you all know how variables work in other languages if this is your first language I'll walk you through it um, I'm going to create a variable name and I'm going to give that variable a value. Okay, so what I'll do is I'm going to call this actually username and I'm going to give it the value Eric. Okay, so again, variables have names and variables have values. And in Bash, we don't really think about types we don't think about integers and things like that everything is just sort of a string by default okay now I'm gonna try to say hello my name so I'm gonna type in hello username maybe give it an exclamation mark for added fun we'll go ahead and run this and you can see that it didn't work it took everything very literally right um, so we're not seeing the substitution happen. Basically what we want to do is we want to substitute the variable name with whatever value is being stored. Okay, so keep in mind that keyword substitution. We need to make substitution happen. So there's a couple of things we got to do. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is replace these with double quotes. And the next thing I'm going to do is put a dollar sign in front of here. So you'll notice the syntax highlighting has changed. So now this thing is now in purple. Uh, that should indicate to you that things are working correctly. Uh, let's go ahead and run this again and see what changed. Okay, so this time it's working properly. And that's great. Some things that you might want to keep in mind. Um, is this uh, this is a string and we need to force the interpreter to understand this space over here as being uh, part of the value that we want to pass in right if I take this out uh, you're gonna notice that things are different here we'll try this we'll just run this by itself oops we're getting Brower command not found right so what that means basically is that the space is getting uh, misinterpreted as being another command we want to want to do that we want the space to be interpreted as part of our string so let me put that in double quotes and this should fix the problem there we go Another special note is with the quotes. So you'll notice that I've used double quotes here. I didn't use single quotes. Single quotes will prevent any substitution from happening. And to show you that, um, I'm just going to open up a script that I've already created here. I'm going to call it, it's called Simple Vars. And uh, you can go back and run these at any time just to see how they work. It should give you an idea about how things how things go. Um, so again, here, this is our variable assignment, and notice that there are no spaces here. Very important. So if I do this, everything breaks. However, so variable assignments, no spaces there. This is hello world. This is what we started with. This is us doing a substitution, and this is us doing no substitution. This is double quotes, and this is single quotes. Okay, so let me go ahead and run this again. Oh, I don't want to make any changes. So I'm going to go simple vars over here. And you can see that on the second line, uh, we had a variable substitution happen. On the third line, we had no variable substitution happen. So single quotes, no substitution. 
So everything so far has been hard coded into our script and that's not usually a great practice. Let's go ahead, I'm gonna show you um, simple read. <clears throat> okay, so at the very top, this is our shebang. Every script should have a shebang. Um, I didn't talk about this before. This is our comment. So I've added comments to a lot of these simple scripts so you can understand what's going on. Documentation is important, but uh, eh, you'll get to there. Okay, and this is us asking the user for a value. On line 10, we're going to use read as the keyword. And what this will do, this is a command. Um, it will take in whatever the user types in, uh, followed by an enter. And whatever that is gets uh, assigned into a new variable called variable in this case. So what this should do is ask the user for input. And then whatever the user inputted, it'll just um, spit that back out to them in the echo command here. So let's take a look. Uh, let's run that. Enter a new value for our variable. Uh, let's call it um, kittens. Okay, you entered kittens. So this is uh, one of the first ways of um, working with user input that you're going to encounter. Um, I believe it's part of the phone script uh, part of the assignment. Um, so that's one way. It's not the best way. And you can think about it like this. Um, whenever you're using commands such as like uh, copy, cp, or rm, or things like that, um, we don't usually run rm, hit enter, and then have a prompt saying, you know, please enter the name of the file you would like to delete, right? What we usually do is we usually just give it um, an argument like this, right? If I want to remove a file called pizza2, I'll just run that and it's going to do it automatically. This has an advantage because um, when we're using arguments like this, we can automate things much faster. So if I use rm pizza in a script, um, that works a lot better than me prompting the user for, you know, some sort of input, okay? It's really hard to automate when you're having prompts like that because we don't know when they show up. We don't know what they're gonna do. Arguments are much, much better. So with that in mind, let's see how we can implement arguments into one of our scripts. Um, here I'm going to run uh, a script called simple args, okay? So, this is me running simple args. Notice I have no arguments right now. I'm just calling the script by itself. This is the output that I get. So right now what you're seeing is number of arguments from the user is zero. The first argument passed in from the user is nothing, blank. Um, if you're doing that in C, if you were doing something similar to this in C, you might get a warning or an error or something like that, but um, Bash will just let you run things with blank arguments. Um, so let's try this again. Uh, let's try this with uh, one argument. Let's call it dog. Okay. So this time when we run it, we're getting back number of arguments from the user is one. The first argument passed in from the user is dog. Second passed in from the user is blank. Let's go dog and hamster. Okay, so hopefully we're seeing how this works. Um, the first thing that we have is we're able to read the number of arguments. <clears throat> An argument here is understood to be um, have a space between it, and um, we're able to see the positional arguments. We can read from the first and we can read from the second argument. So. Why don't I open up this uh, script and we'll take a look at how it works. No, that's not right. 
Okay, so starting from the very top, there's our shebang. Um, I've left some comments here just trying to explain how this thing is supposed to work. Reminder of what an argument is in this sort of case. It comes after the command that we want to run. So here we try writing the script with zero arguments. Okay, so here's where all the important stuff starts happening. I'm using an echo command over here. This is the first line that you read. And what I've got is this variable here. This is a special built-in variable. This is a variable that is included. This is a variable that you don't have to, you know, initialize it. You don't have to assign anything to it. It's already built into Bash for you. And it is a dollar sign and a hash symbol or dollar sign and a number sign. However you want to think about it. Shift 3, that's what it is. Um, and it contains an integer, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, all the way up. That integer is the number of arguments. Okay. Now going down here, we can see the first argument passed in from the user is included here under dollar sign one. Okay. And then the second argument is under dollar sign two. So it's actually very, very easy for us to be grabbing the value of those arguments. All we have to do is use dollar sign one, dollar sign two, dollar sign three, dollar sign four. It goes up all the way to dollar sign nine. What I generally say is if you have nine arguments in your script and you are having to uh, get their values from dollar sign nine, um, you're doing things wrong. Um, you shouldn't be doing that. Generally, you know, one or two arguments is good. <clears throat> if you'll see later on in assignment number three, we have ways of dealing with more than um, that number of arguments, um, but there's a better way to be handling it. But anyway, this works for one and two. All right, so as you can see, we have a lot of ways of dealing with um, arguments. Um, and when we were running this as before, this wasn't really a very good script because um, we're giving this really weird output to the user. Like it's really hard for them to understand this and it looks buggy. So what we really want to do is change the logic of our script so that um, uh, we change the output based off of how many arguments they've given us. So let me show you simple if. Vim simple if. So this brings us to talk about if statements. Um, hopefully you've worked with if statements before in your other programming labs. Um, if not, I'll go through it very briefly and I can definitely talk more about it. So far, everything over here is exactly the same about these two scripts, right? I'm printing off a message over here to the user um, and it just outputs the number of arguments. Now over here is where I start to introduce um, some conditional logic. So the way that this works is if is going to be a condition and that condition can be true or false. If the condition is true, we move to then, and between then and fi, we're gonna just run each of those actions. Only if the condition is true. If the condition is false, if this condition is false right here, we're gonna skip all that, and then just keep proceeding from line 21, 22, 23, 24. Okay? Hopefully that's fairly straightforward to you, but let's take a look at the condition here. Um, dollar sign hash is our number of arguments. If that number of arguments is equal to one, then we're going to print this message. If this is equal to two, then we're going to print this message. Okay. So one of these paths is going to be skipped depending on how many arguments we've given it. Let's go ahead and run this. And I'm going to use dog. 
And you can see the number of arguments from the user is one. The argument passed in from the user is dog. Okay, and if I run this with dog and cat, you can see that the output of this has changed just to reflect that. Okay, so if statements are very good for remembering this kind of stuff. Now, um, we can sort of simplify this a little bit by using if and else. So, what I had over here was basically one if statement with one condition. And then we're testing a second condition over here. Let's combine that and I'll show you a simple if else. There we go. So this is what an if else statement looks like in Bash. At the very top here, I've created a variable called condition and I've given it the value of one. This is hard coded, so this, this uh, script never changes. If the value of condition is equal to one, then we're gonna proceed with line seven and line eight. However, if this condition is not true, if it is false, then we move on to else and we do these two actions and we stop. Okay. No matter what we do, no matter which path we take here, we're always going to end on line 14. Okay, And this line over here is just telling you, copy this script over, make a copy in your home, change things about it and see if you can you know just get comfortable with it okay what else do I want to point out about this before I go ah there's it there's always one thing so bash is a kind of a strict in terms of how you uh, format things um, if you take out the spaces over here you may find that this no longer behaves properly okay so when I was learning this, I definitely spent 45 minutes trying to debug stuff, and I was just trying everything I could think of, but the problem was the space is there. 